people like me. You need people like me so you can point your fucking fingers and say that's the bad guy. That's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. The latest out of the women's super bantamweight division as it pertains to Erica Cruz and what seems to be a push to make a fight between her and Argentina's own hard-punching slugger, Nazarena Romero, a fighter that we've talked about here on this channel on more than one occasion. There is a precedence for the match. Before Erica beat Mayerlene Rivas for what was her WBA title, Mayerlene had a fight with Nazarena that ended in a draw, and there wasn't a second fight. There wasn't a rematch. Now it seems Nazarena is targeting Erica. Erica Cruz, who sports a professional record of 17 wins with two losses, no draws, three knockouts, having never been knocked out in 19 professional bouts. Could Nazarena Romero change that? Could she be the first to stop Erica Cruz? These are two of the more violent fighters, violent punchers in the super bantamweight division here today. Nazarena sports a professional record of 13 wins with no losses, one draw, seven knockouts. Nazarena, who's a little younger and less experienced as a professional, than Erica. The, what she lacks in experience, she makes up for in power and combinations and aggression. She's a dangerous fighter, one of the more dangerous fighters anywhere at or around 122 pounds. And it looks like in the not so distant future, Erica may be so confronted with her, confronted with Nazarena Romero, who last saw action in June of last year. She fought two times last year. The Mayerlene Rivas fight. Who is a common opponent between them, between Nazarena and Erica. And as stated, the fight with Mayerlene, it ended in a draw, even though it shouldn't have. Mayerlene barely survived that confrontation with Nazarena Romero, whereas things were a little bit more competitive between her and Erica. Erica, who last saw action in November of last year against that same Mayerlene Rivas. Erica was comparatively busier last year. She started off the year losing to Amanda Serrano at 126, moving down to 122, and beating Melissa Parker. Very good fighter, hard puncher, and a crafty southpaw. She beat Melissa, then she moved on from that to beat Mayerlene Rivas for what was Mayerlene's WBA title. Erica is best described as a mid-range to inside pressure fighter, volume puncher, and a very awkward one. Hailing from high altitude Mexico City. Like Isaac Cruz, her nephew, like Emmanuel Navarrete, fighters from that region, characteristically awkward fighters that are difficult to deal with, whereas Nazarena Romero, Nazarena is a little bit more upright and a little bit more conventional. Erica is awkward. Barreling forward, slipping and bobbing and weaving under shots, bringing over big hooks, big looping shots. Erica is awkward. Whereas Nazarena is a bit more upright and a bit more conventional, though still a handful, still very strong, I'd wager. She's the stronger puncher of the two. What you see from Erica. She has a penchant for overshooting the distance and ending up in a clinch, slapping with her hooks. Quality of her combinations, they do get a bit messy at times, whereas Nazarena shows a bit more form and more power. Her punches are crisper cleaner. Even though Erica Cruz has comparatively faced better fighters than Nazarena has faced so far, Jelena Marjanovic, Melissa Esquivel, Amanda Serrano, Melissa Parker. They share a common opponent in Mayerlene Rivas. It's the Rivas fight that gives it away for me that Nazarena is the bigger puncher because Mayerlene Rivas did not wear Nazarena's punches as well as she wore Erica Cruz's punches. She was able to take Erica's punches a little better than Nazarena's. Thus, I think Nazarena's the stronger puncher of the two. Erica has a penchant for collapsing the pocket by overshooting the distance and ending up in a clinch, whereas Nazarena, she can create a bit of space to get punches out, get punches off. Move around. She's a bit more athletic 
than Erica Cruz. And a bit more explosive. It's gonna be interesting to see what happens because they both have the same base style with subtle differences and nuances, but they are both pressure fighters. So who will be able to handle the pressure that the other girl brings? Will Erica be able to handle Nazarena or will Nazarena be able to handle Erica? I'd give Erica the edge and experience and durability. Don't forget, she went the distance with Amanda Serrano up there at 126. This fight would be at 122. So Erica's got experience and durability. Give Nazarena Romero the edge in speed and power. Not as experienced as Erica, not as battle tested, but to the eye, she looks to be the much sharper puncher. Mexico versus Argentina, what is an underrated rivalry in the sport. You're always hearing about the age old Mexico versus Puerto Rico rivalry. That's not what it used to be. Whereas Mexico versus Argentina or Mexico versus Japan at the lower weights and men's boxing, those are more vibrant rivalries in the sport today. This fight has all the makings of a barn burner as pressure fighters like Erica Cruz, like Nazarena Romero, they have a tendency to stay in character, to carry on from one fight to the next, applying the same strategy. But because Nazarena Romero is such a big puncher, one of the bigger punchers anywhere at or around these weights, you do have to question if Erica Cruz will be able to stay in character, be that pressure fighter, and keep the pressure on. It's a sensational fight that I'm looking forward to. I expect expect it to happen in either the end of the first quarter of this year or in the second. For Erica's newly obtained WBA title, Nazarena wants her crack at the apple. In men's super bantamweight news, as it pertains to the upcoming Inui versus Neri fight set to go down in May, Luis Neri received an indefinite suspension from the Japanese Boxing Commission in March of 2018. But officials involved have been assured the Mexican will be reinstated for the undisputed title fight versus Naoya Inoue in May in Tokyo, sources told ESPN. I feel that... If the Japanese Boxing Commission is going as far as lifting this long-standing ban on Luis Neri, it's because they're very confident that Inui will defeat him, that Inui will dispatch him. The ban was handed down following Neri's pair of stoppage wins over Japan's longtime champion, Shinsuke Yamanaka, who we talked about in my previous video. Luis Neri scored a fourth round TKO win over Yamanaka to capture the WBC bantamweight title in August of 2017, but was suspended after when the banned substance Zilpaterol was found in a system, a weight cutting agent. Neri argued the adverse finding was the result of tainted meat consumed in Mexico. In the March 2018 rematch, Neri stopped Yamanaka in round two, but did so after he weighed 121 pounds for what was a 118 pound title fight. The pair of violations is what led to the ban. But Neri has earned a shot against Inui, who usually fights in Japan, when he scored an 11 7th round knockout over Azat Havanesian back in February of last year. The WBC title eliminator was named ESPN's runner-up for fight of the year. Neri being Inui's mandatory, Inui being on the hook to satisfy him, you can see the rationale that went into lifting the ban, in tandem with Japanese Boxing Commission's confidence that he knew he can finish the job that Yamanaka couldn't. Some months ago, there was talk of bringing Inui back to America, where he's already fought three times. I believe he's fought two times in Las Vegas and once, once. in California. But it seems that they'd rather do this thing in Japan. They'd rather do this thing in their neck of the woods. To that, an American fight fan that goes by the name Jason T stated, there's something fishy about those dudes keep fighting in Japan. Is he a moron? Not necessarily. He is an American, and like many American boxing fans, he seems to think that America is still the mecca of boxing, that everyone, no matter where they're from or what they draw there, they should have to fight here, they should have to come here, even when they're a bigger draw than the other guy, a guy with no understanding of the sport and how the sport works. Like many Americans, Inui is a bigger draw in Japan than any 115, any 118, and any 122 pound fighter. In fact, Inui is a bigger draw in Japan 
than most American fighters, and I do mean most. I'm not exaggerating. Regularly fighting in front of crowds upwards of 14,000 to 20,000, Inui is a star in his neck of the woods. Thus, why would he need to come here when he's generating so much money over there? You do a fight where the fight generates the most money, and Americans don't really have a hankering for the lower weights. They never have. Light flyweight, flyweight, super flyweight, bantamweight, super bantamweight. These are divisions that are primarily dominated by South American fighters, Mexican fighters, Japanese fighters, but not really Americans. Thus, the audience for these fighters and these fights, these divisions, lies abroad, not here, not in America. So why would Naoya Inoue, who's already a big star where he's from, and the biggest name anywhere at or around these weights, needless to say, he's a bigger name in Japan and a bigger draw than Luis Neri is anywhere on the planet. Why would he have to come to America to fight him when he knew he's the bigger draw, he's the undisputed champion, he's a two-time undisputed champion and a four-division champion overall? Why would it be suspicious that he's fighting where he draws, where he draws the most, where he draws more than everybody else? It's not suspicious. There's nothing suspicious about it. It's tantamount to when Anthony Joshua was drawing more than Deontay Wilder in the UK than Wilder was drawing in the US Americans. They were not prepared to accept that. They need to believe they're the center of the planet, the center of the universe, the life of the party. But Neri's Mexican. These people are fucking stupid. Why do you think Stefan Fulk, who was a unified champion at the time, why do you think he traveled to Japan to take on Inui? Because the fight with Inui makes more money in Japan, more money for everybody, the promoter, the managers, the fighters. It makes more money for everybody over there because he's a bigger draw over there than Stefan was over here. Same applies to Luis Neri, but you can't tell these people that. And it's because these people seem to think the entire world is supposed to bend over backwards to accommodate them and give them what they want, whatever they want, even when it's unreasonable. Inui versus Neri, Inui versus Tapales, Inui versus Fulton. Here in America would not be as big an attraction as it would be in Japan. In Japan, there are a lot of people that are interested in those fights. They'll pay to be there, they'll pay to see them, which equals more money for the show, for the fighters, and everybody involved. It's basic arithmetic, but a lot of these guys are bad at math. Japan's not a third world country, you know. And while the market has opened up globally and by Boxing is more of a global sport now than it is in previous years. Here in America, domestically, the sport is shrinking. So why on earth would Inui have to come here? To satisfy the whims of a few who are really only interested in one or two fighters anyway. American arrogance aside, Inui versus Neri is underway. And in men's heavyweight news, Anthony Joshua versus Martin Bacoli, WBA eliminator, could be ordered, says Ben Shalom. It's not a bad fight, but being honest with you, I don't think Martin Bacoli is on Anthony's radar. Boxer head Ben Shalom, who promotes heavyweight contender Martin Bacoli, believes the WBA could order a final eliminator with former two-time world champion Anthony Joshua. Bacoli is the number one rated fighter under the WBA, with Joshua sitting at number two. Should the order come down? and Joshua takes a pass. The number three contender is Daniel Dubois, and I could go for that. I could go for Martin Bacoli versus Daniel Dubois. Joshua is already slated to return to the ring in early March in Saudi Arabia in a huge crossover fight against former UFC champion Francis Ngannou, and if he takes care of business with Francis, and I think he's going to, I think he would sooner fight Philippe Pergovic or Zile Chang Chong. than Martin Bacoli. I think those two guys are more on Anthony's radar than Martin is. It's a fight I think that Sky Sports would get behind. If the fight were ordered and the two teams were unable to reach a deal by the deadline and a purse bid ensued, I'm sure that the people at Sky would pay handsomely to get Anthony back on their network, but I don't think it's going to get that far. The current WBA champion the full champion is Oleksandr Yusik. The secondary champion is Mahmoud Char. And that's what isn't being said. Mahmoud Char is the WBA's regular champion, so in theory, if the WBA's ordering a fight, shouldn't it be a fight between Martin Bacoli 
and Mahmoud Char. The aim is for Martin to fight early in the year and continue his impressive run. I'm looking forward to seeing him fully fit when he will look even more devastating. Of course, Anthony Joshua is number two in the WBA's rankings, and so it would make sense that the fight would be ordered and Martin would be ready. I don't think Anthony's going that route. Like it or lump it. And why does it seem like people are expecting Anthony to fight more fighters than, say, Tyson Fury or Oleksandr Yusik, the winner of the fight between them? Why do they want him to fight Martin Bacoli, yeah. Zile Zhang, yeah. Philippe Hergovic? There are still people out there asking him to fight Deontay Wilder, even though Wilder lost his last fight. What about David Higgins? Joseph Puck, his longtime manager and promoter, he wants a Joshua fight, a rematch between Anthony Joshua and Joseph Parker. So alongside Martin Bacoli, seems like there's a lot of other guys in the queue. Martin remains the most avoided heavyweight in the world, and his recent performances have only added to that. We're looking forward to a big year for Martin, who will inevitably fight for world titles in the not-so-distant future. Bacoli is very familiar with Joshua from their sparring wars in the gym. Joshua had often used Bacoli as a sparring partner in in training camp. Not against that fight, that's an interesting fight. Two very heavy hitters. I like it. Not against it. I just don't think it's gonna happen. I don't think Martin Bacoli is on Anthony's radar. If he takes care of business with Francis Ngannou, he'll likely pursue a Philippe Pergovic fight or a Zile Chang fight. The winner of Usyk versus Fury if they're available. Martin Bacoli says, I learned how to stop him. Inside, he doesn't want to be put under pressure. Joshua, I'm gonna put him under pressure and he'll give up. He doesn't know how to fight on the inside, so give him pressure on the inside until he gives up. And sounds good, sounds real good, but Martin Bacoli himself was stopped by a smaller man in Michael Hunter many, many years ago. Michael Hunter, who's actually been calling for a second fight, calling for a rematch, and Martin doesn't seem none too interested in avenging the loss, his lone defeat to Michael Hunter. So when Ben Shalom calls Martin the most avoided heavyweight in the heavyweight division. I don't know about that. I understand why Ben Shalom is addressing the potential matchup because Martin's ranked at number one and Anthony's ranked at number two. But by all rights, the fight that the WBA should be ordering is a fight between Martin Bacoli and Mahmoud Char. This is the crown of mandatory challenger for the winner of Fury versus Usyk, right? Or is this the crown of mandatory challenger for Mahmoud Char, the WBA's secondary champion. Do you see the confusion that secondary titles create? That if Anthony and Martin were to fight, who would they be the mandatory for? But two years ago, the WBA started a process where they would phase out all of their interim and regular titles, their secondary titles, but Mahmoud Char's got one. So why don't you just order a fight between him and Martin Bacoli and chuck that baby belt? I don't think Joshua versus Bacoli sees the light of day. I think that Martin may end up fighting someone else in the WBA's rank standings. Maybe Daniel Dubois? That's a good fight. Perhaps Joseph Parker or unbeaten Frankie Sanchez? That's a good fight. And a fight with Anthony's a good fight. I just don't think it's gonna see the light of day. With the number of guys waiting in the queue for an Anthony Joshua fight, you'd think he's the reigning champion. You'd think he's the guy with all the belts, but he's just a contender like everybody else with a bunch of guys in the queue. And we know why. It's because of the money. It's because of Anthony's drawing power that belt or no belt, champion or not, this guy's still the biggest draw at heavyweight. They don't call him the landlord for nothing. He lives rent-free inside of all these guys' heads. But he can't fight all these guys. He can only fight one guy, one guy at a time. So Martin better find something to do. 